I want to welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to have you all here. This is a very new environment for OCB. Uh, we've never had a fully virtual summer workshop before. My name is Heather Benway. I'm a senior research specialist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the executive officer of the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry Project Office. You'll see the, the term OCB for those of you who are newbies. That stands for Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry. I am an oceanographer with interests in carbon and climate science and marine biogeochemistry. Um, as of this morning, when I logged in, I was really excited to see that we have 767 people registered for our workshop this year. So we have a higher level of international participation than ever, which we've really, really enjoyed this past year, especially. Um, it started with our OCB webinar series and continues with this virtual workshop. And we're just really excited to have you all here. Please bear with us. We're all kind of uh, trying to get through this virtual world together. And um, please be patient, have grace, have kindness. Um, Just want to take you through a few basics today. So first, I always like to start our meetings with the big thank you list because it's so, so important. Um, this virtual meeting, I know that that in person meetings are a lot of work and they're very expensive. In person meeting, virtual meetings are a ton of work as well. I want to start by acknowledging our sponsors. Um, NSF and NASA, because OCB would not exist without them. They fund the project office here in Woods Hole. I want to thank our physical host, Woods Hole Oceanographic, for putting up with our in-person meetings and just being a gracious host and providing all of the resources we need to support our community. I especially want to thank our event hosts, e-poster boards, a big shout out to the folks we've been working with most closely to put this meeting together. That includes Mike and Taylor and Chase and Catherine. Um, and there are so many other e-poster board staff and technicians here with us, and you'll get to know lots of them throughout the meeting. I wanna thank our OCB Scientific Steering Committee and the chairs for all of the plenary sessions. They work really hard every year to put together a compelling program. I wanna thank our speakers. So hopefully you all got a chance to watch all of the fantastic talks for today's sessions on our website. I want to thank my project office, um, for whom this meeting would never even come close to existing. Um, May Mahegan, the communications officer, Barry Zawaski, the administrative associate. They are amazing to work with and so very capable and amazing. I, I'm very, very lucky. Finally, I want to thank you because, as I always say every year, it's the people who make the meeting. So thanks for being here. Come to as much of the meeting as you can. We are recording all of the um, stage sessions so that you'll be able to, to come back and if you missed something, um, you can Twitter using the hashtag OCB2021. This workshop was planned while working on the ancestral lands of the Wampanoag Nation made up of Mashpee, Aquina, Her and the Herring Pond tribes. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and the lands of our participants. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the substantial traditional and local knowledge that indigenous people hold and sustain. This is really important for setting the tone for this meeting and I, I beg all of you to please take heed because we take this very seriously. OCB's code of conduct, which can be found on our website, OCB does not tolerate harassment, bullying, intimidation, or discrimination in any form of any kind, any place. Physical or verbal abuse of any kind of anybody involved in our meeting is not tolerated. Please avoid any deliberate disruption of presentations or any form of communication. We have basic ground rules being respectful, critiquing ideas, not individuals, being observant and being an ally. If you experience or you witness any sort of troubling behavior that is that does not abide by the code of conduct, 
please report it. Please be patient and kind, especially with technical difficulties. This is a new virtual space and we're going to do the very best we can to make sure that we can all connect with one another. You will see an orange button throughout the workshop for the code of conduct in incident reporting. This will be on the navigation bar. Please click on it. There's a form in there for reporting. If there's an incident or if you prefer to use our email address, it only goes to May, Mary and myself to report any issues that you might have during our meeting. Now, just to give you a little bit about OCB, what do we do? What are we all about? There are some newbies here, I'm sure. Um, OCB is a network of scientists and we work across disciplines to understand the ocean's role in the global carbon cycle and how marine ecosystems and biogeochemical cycles are functioning and how they are responding to environmental change. OCB was established by NSF, NASA, and NOAA way back in 2006 as a major activity of the US Carbon Cycle Science Program. And we are still going strong and our, our community is evolving and taking shape in so many different ways and supporting so many new research directions. <coughs> Excuse me, I managed to get sick last week, so I'm getting over that. Like I said, the OCB Project Office is based at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and has received sustained support from NSF and NASA since its inception. OCB's scientific interests really lie at the, the intersection of these three icons here over on the, on the left side. We're really, we're really interested in how biogeochemistry, marine organisms, climate and environmental change, how all of those intersect. And if you look at our six overarching science focus areas in green, you can get a sense of the breadth of our program. There's a lot here, there's a lot to unpack and I don't have as much time as I'd like to go into that today. So I really encourage you to explore our website, subscribe to our e-newsletter. It only comes out once a month except for special announcements. And you can email us, you can find us on social media, including Twitter and YouTube. Also, I wanted to let you know that there will be an OCB table in most of the meeting spaces, so you can always come and hang out and talk with us, too, if you want to learn more about the program and what we do. And if your research fits into a certain potential activity, come talk to us. We're, we'll be around. We're at the OCB table. The networking space has an OCB table. Just to give you a sense of what we do on a daily basis, um, we support this big open interdisciplinary science workshop every summer with um, we usually try to set pretty broad cross-cutting plenary topics to get a really broad faction of our community together but normally this workshop's in woods hole and we can only pack about 200 people into the conference room not nearly 800 like we can in e-poster boards <coughs> excuse me we also hold more targeted community workshops on emergent research areas. Um, there's an upcoming virtual workshop on the Global Ocean Biogeochemistry Array that's happening at the end of this month. You can see the little icon up here in the corner and you can find information about that on our website um, and you can click there to register. We, we fund small working groups on very focused topics. For example, mixotropes and mixotrophy is a brand new working group that you'll be hearing about later on in the program. We're trying to do lots of um, advertising of new activities in our, our agenda. We support intercalibration and intercomparison activities, training activities, synthesis work, anything that helps support science and new research areas. Um, with regard to science planning, this is another important part of what we do. Um, most recently, um, OCB formed a subcommittee on ocean atmosphere interaction and we held an uh, air sea community workshop, um, which was really aimed at trying to identify a cohesive set of US priorities and contributions to this larger international ocean atmosphere program called SOLAS, Surface Ocean Lower Atmosphere Study. And so we have a a really great science plan that's in the works that came out of that workshop. We are interested in education outreach. We try to provide access to education and outreach materials that our community develops and also try to develop them um, here in the project office. We've done infographics on um, ocean fertilization. We've developed slide decks on ocean carbon uptake. Um, the schematic below 
is a really great um, a great uh, diagram that differentiates the processes that drive the cycling of natural versus anthropogenic CO2 in the ocean. So you can download that from our website and use that as part of your teaching. We are also really, really all about early career training and engagement. We really prioritize early career travel support and OCB activities and also entertain bulk travel support requests to facilitate participation of early career researchers in workshops and training activities. How does OCB work? Because, you know, everybody always asks this question. Um, if you're new to the table, OCB is a bottom-up program, meaning that the leadership and activities of OCB are really shaped by its community through an open process. OCB is very nimble and responsive to the needs of the community, and that is why our, our focused research areas are continually evolving to keep up with what the community needs. Our scientific steering committee and its topical sub subcommittees all include an open community nomination process. We release a, solic a solicitation for OCB activity proposals every year, and that's how the rest of OCB's activities come to be. They are based on proposals that we receive from the community. We don't fund research, but we inspire research through our activities. Um, our activities really provide an interdisciplinary collision space for people to come together around new ideas, new research areas. And I really, I love this idea incubator here because that is what OCB really is. I want to just give you a brief run through on our, what our virtual meeting space looks like this year because I know this is overwhelming. I know people don't have time to read email, and I understand that because I am overloaded with it myself. So we're going to do our best to make sure that you get where you need to go. E-poster boards has been amazing, and they've customized this meeting space to help meet the needs of our workshop and foster high-quality interactions. While we cannot replicate an in-person meeting, we can do a lot with this platform. So please be patient. Tech problems happen. Often, a quick browser refresh is all you need. There are e-poster board staff at help desks all throughout the platform. And there is a great intro video in the upper left corner of every meeting space that is specific to our meeting. So I highly encourage you to take five minutes to click on that and watch it. It will just pop up and you can watch it. It's not gonna kick you out of the meeting space or your browser. First thing to note is there are eight floors, eight floors to our meeting space. Use the elevator to move up and down. There are navigation bars running up on both, in most spaces running down, up and down both sides of the meeting spaces. The green buttons will take you to one of our five different spaces. So the lobby is the entry point each day. That's the link you will receive for each day of the meeting. This is really for informal interaction, milling about, hanging out, catching up with colleagues, and happy hours. We're going to have some fun happy hours. Um, the breakout room is being used for our plenary sessions and other small group discussions where we can really break up into groups and have more meaningful conversations. The lecture hall is where we'll have our agency and OCB activity highlights and report outs and also a couple of really important community planning panel discussions. The poster hall kind of speaks for itself. We'll have interactive poster presentations there. We didn't get quite as many posters as we had anticipated from the registration data, so we have removed two of the poster sessions. So we only have posters on the four dates listed here. Um, we are updating the agenda on the workshop website all the time, so just keep an eye on it. It's, it's going to be changing. It's in flux. But those poster sessions are firm, and the dates are all assigned. You can find those links in the email May sent today and also on the poster page of the website. Um, and the network area is, I'm going to talk in more detail, but that's a really a place for you. I created that for you to talk with colleagues about science, about life, about JEDI topics. The dark blue buttons on the right here, these are meeting guides and documents. You can get a daily agenda snapshot by clicking there. It'll just pull up a snapshot of today's agenda. You can go to the workshop website. You can visit the virtual poster gallery. You can visit the poster directory to figure out where you go when you need to present. 
For those presenting posters, the poster directory will tell you which day and where in the poster hall you need to go. Just make sure that you sign up for and complete one of those ePoster Board's test sessions before your live poster presentation so that you know how to screen share. When you see these white buttons, these will provide instructional videos and guidance on different aspects of ePoster Board's, which Mike is going to talk about later on. Um, core elements, I've already gone over most of these, the plenary sessions. We've got pre-recorded talks on the website, which you should try to watch before the live sessions, because the live sessions will focus on panel style Q&A, as well as interactive small group discussion. The poster sessions, as I've indicated already, or the virtual gallery, just a note here, those posters will be up in the gallery through August, so there's some time to view them throughout the summer. The networking sessions, I'm going to talk in more detail here shortly on that, um, but we're I think we're adding another one on the 24th, so we'll have lots of time for that because I think that's really important. Happy hours are going to happen in the lobby. That's informal time to meet with old friends, make new ones, bring your pets, your kids, stretchy pants, enjoy a time zone, zone appropriate beverage. Just use them to connect with each other. And I am happy to extend these after the lobby closes. I've, I've set up a whole bunch of wonder rooms. So depending on interest, I, I'll be dropping links for those if people want to have after hours gatherings. Do look closely at the agenda. It's being updated all the time. There are also going to be OCB activity highlights. There'll be a community planning discussion on future production and distribution of CO2 and seawater reference materials, which I know a lot of people here care about. The agency report outs and so much more. On the final day, this will be an important day for updates and discussions, networking time, and potentially a surprise drawing for cool OCB swag. But that's only for those who stay with us through the bitter end. Finally, the networking space. When we looked at the registration data, the overwhelming goal for this meeting was networking. If I could make a word cloud, that word would have been at the center. Having that opportunity to interact with colleagues, which has been so sorely missing from our professional lives and our personal lives this past year, we've really tried to create this space with that in mind. We've, we've have plenty of tables with topics to guide discussion and plenty of free space for you to create your own topics. Use the networking directory, that'll be in blue, to navigate all eight floors. There's something different on every floor, I promise you. For tables that, some of the tables will be our partner programs. They might have representatives there to want to share information. So there are whiteboards and you can find out more about those programs by looking at the whiteboard content. You can also see if there are people that are manning a table, you can look on the networking directory and it'll tell you their name and, and what days, which sessions they'll be able to be there so that you can plan your time accordingly. There are also these um, little two-seaters. There are four of them on each floor of the networking session or networking space. So use them. Have one-on-one -on -one meetings. Do impromptu interviews and recruiting. We've created a special space on the first floor for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion topics. The top floor is for early career flow folks. Please note that we've created Jedi Jamboard and an Early Career Jamboard, and that's where we want you guys to funnel information to us. Tell us how we can better support Jedi, Jedi activities and actions, how we can better support our early career community. These are really important information conduits that will be living documents, so we encourage you to use these Jamboards throughout the meeting. There will also be an ocean data roundtable. I'm not telling you which floor anything is on so that you have to explore it all, but um, Biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office will be there. Um, and, and several of our US and international partner programs are in the house too, and they will have tables. And, and most importantly, we'll have a whole section for our agency managers who are here to talk to you all about funding opportunities. In addition, you'll hear more about the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Um, Susan Roberts has put together a nice pre-recorded talk in the networking space and will be available to talk to people. Finally, I'm a little bit over time, but I just want to remind you to make your profile work for you. If you click on your little picture up here, click on my profile, you can edit it, you can add pictures, contact information, institution, 
Most importantly, use this headline and make it work for you. Notice I've put in here that I manage the OCD office and I can, I can answer any questions you have about the program. You can put any tagline you want in here. It's a great networking tool. Like I'm trying to find a postdoc in blah, blah, blah. I am looking for collaborators. This, this is a really great opportunity to, it's almost like a little flag that you can wave um, to help you connect with colleagues. Finally, if you need any help, there are help desks on, on, in all the spaces for both OCB and e-poster boards, um, speakers and poster presenters. I've already, we've invited you to join these community sites to get the training you need to be able to screen share. There are lots of instructional videos. Um, I, I, I encourage you to use these resources. That's why we've provided them. And there's tons of information on our website too. May has done an amazing job making sure that our website is easy to navigate. So please use that. You can click on it and it'll open up in a new tab and give you whatever you need. Now, to help welcome you and describe the plenary sessions in a bit more detail, since the SSC is really um, the, the creator, um, the curator of these amazing plenary sessions, I want to introduce the leadership of the OCB Scientific Steering Committee, SSC Chair Margie Friedrichs from Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and SSC Vice Chair Victoria Coles from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Thanks, Heather. Um, so Victoria and I just wanted to take a few moments to welcome you all to the summer's uh, virtual OCB workshop. We know this has been a really tough past 16 months for everyone with field work delays and cancellations and trying to balance work while homeschooling kids. And of course, the losses of colleagues, friends, and family members that so many of us have felt over this past year. But we're really so happy to be here today for the start of the OCB summer workshop. Heather, May, and Mary Zawaski and the OCB Scientific Steering Committee, the SSC, as well as the many session chairs have all been working for, for many months to organize a meeting that, that we hope you'll all find inspiring and, and informative. And we're certainly very sorry that we can't all be together right now in person in Woods Hole. Um, and we're really looking forward to next year when hopefully we will be. Um, but the virtual nature of this year's meeting really does have some advantages with, um, as, as uh, Heather mentioned, the most notable probably being the, the greater participation of uh, high diversity of, of participants, many of whom would simply have not have been able to attend um, for logistical, economic, or, or personal reasons. Um, for example, as, as Heather mentioned, um, our international participation rates probably more than double what, what it has been in recent past years. So, of course, we apologize for those of you in different time zones who are very early or going to be staying up super late with us, but we're glad you're here and look forward to your participation throughout the meeting. So it's always a real challenge to come up with session topics for summer OCB workshops, and this year was no exception. The OCB SSC received lots of excellent suggestions uh, for, for topics, and ultimately we had to narrow this down to five. And as always, our sessions are very diverse and cover a wide range of topics uh, related to ocean carbon and biogeochemistry. And as always, uh, those of you attending may be experts in some of these topics, but I guarantee you that no one is gonna be an expert in all of these session topics. So we're really hoping that the discussions we have as part of each session is gonna engage, they'll engage not only the, the experts in these topics, but also uh, will hopefully be informative and rewarding for those who might know very little about the topic being discussed. And it's really our, our sincere hope that participants will not only attend the session for which they know the most, but also attend sessions for which they know very little, since really the, the potential for interdisciplinary ideas and collaborations and networking are really gonna be enhanced for everyone when we bring scientists from across the spectrum of ocean scientists together. So I just quickly want to highlight the five sessions that, that we have at the workshop this summer. Um, and today, as you know, we're starting off with bridging the divide between ocean biology and geochemistry. And we're going to be highlighting scientific insights from uh, co-collected ocean chemistry and biology data sets. And this is in anticipation of a US Biogeoscapes planning workshop that's going to be happening later in the fall. And then this Friday, on June 11th, we will have a session devoted to opportunities and challenges in ecological forecasting. 
Um, and this is also in, in kind of a, the early planning stages of a joint U.S. CLIVAR OCB community workshop that's going to be um, held next April in Woods Hole in 2022. And next slide, on June 15th, we have sessions also on June 15th and 18th, with June 15th being uh, one based on uh, ocean-based negative emissions technologies. Um, and their uh, participants are going to be able to learn more about proposed ocean carbon dioxide removal strategies and, and hopefully together we'll discuss the research needs and, and engagement of scientists in this process. And then June 18th is a little um, out, uh, out of the ordinary, Ocean Worlds. We're going to be starting some discussions between scientists studying Earth's ocean and then other ocean, oceans in our, in our solar system. So uh, hopefully identify uh, areas of collaboration. So that'll be interesting. And then finally, on June 22nd, we have a session on optical biogeochemistry above and below the, the waterline. Um, so yeah, so we've got some great sessions. Uh, really, We're really excited to see how this virtual format works out. It's been a real challenge for us to try to figure out how to foster the wonderful spirit of the OCB summer meeting virtually. And your engagement today and throughout the remaining sessions is really going to be key to making this a success. So thank you in advance for attending and being engaged. And please let us know what is what works and what doesn't. And then finally, on behalf of the whole OCB uh, SSC, I just want to thank again Heather, May, and Mary for all of their hard work getting us to where we all right now about to start our first virtual OCB summer workshop. And with that, I'll hand the meeting over to Mike Elliott, who's going to give us a brief overview of e-poster boards. All right, welcome everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. So we're excited to be your host in this virtual conference software. Uh, as everyone's mentioned, there's a little bit of a learning curve with this software compared to a typical Zoom or Teams meeting. So we want you to know you can find us for tech help, and we like uh, to ask for patience and grace as everyone learns how to navigate the software since many of you are first time guests and presenters. Uh, sorry to those of you who are hearing some of this content again from attending a prior session, um, but we're gonna cover all the information that you need to know to be successful today. So right now uh, we're in what we call stage presentation mode and uh, we're in the breakout room event space. Um, the stage presentation takes over everyone's screen so that we all see what's on stage regardless of what table we're at in the room. If you're not a speaker, you can interact via the chat or the Q&A panel at the right side of your screen. Uh, you can enter things in the Q&A anonymously, and you can click items in the Q&A to upvote questions or comments that you'd like to see featured or addressed by the speakers. Uh, today, the program is pretty much split between the breakout room, which is, again, where we are now, and later today, we'll funnel you toward the networking area. Next time you join the event, uh, as soon as Friday, you may notice that uh, there are other event spaces, including the poster hall and lecture hall. Uh, each space has its own function, as Heather described, and please definitely keep your eyes peeled for announcements in the uh, software that's going to be directing you to the event uh, spaces where activities will be taking place. Um, for the upcoming session, we're going to stay here in stage mode and bring up a group of panelists on stage. They're going to go through a presentation and then issue a charge to breakout sessions. And at that point, we're going to return you to map mode, which is what you saw when you came in through the lobby. Um, when we return you to map mode, you're going to find yourself at a table with others. You'll see icons filling seats on the map. Each icon represents a person, and each table is intentionally limited to the number of visible seats. Uh, you can move to a new table by double-clicking on any table that has an open seat for you. Uh, you can find additional tables on other floors using the control panel at the left side of your screen when you're in the map mode. And again, you'll only see that in map mode. You won't see that here on stage. Uh, during the breakouts and networking, you can control your camera and microphone via a control panel at the bottom of your screen. We certainly encourage everyone to be an active participant and have cameras and microphones on. Again, you won't have those controls until we return you back to the map. Um, consider muting your microphone temporarily if you have any audio feedback when others are speaking. Headphones are definitely your friend when it comes to preventing audio feedback. One of the other buttons you'll see in the toolkit uh, at the bottom of the screen is a whiteboard button. For the breakouts, we've put uh, discussion questions for you in the whiteboard, and you can feel free to use those to help steer your conversations. The networking area, as Heather mentioned, also has specific content in the whiteboards at specific tables, which are on specific floors. So uh, note that you're never stuck where you are in the software unless we're here in stage presentation mode. Uh, that said, we have put a link at the top of the general chat in this space in case you need to leave this particular space during the presentation. 
you can always return to the lobby where everything else is accessible. Um, we encourage you to move around and meet as many as, uh, as many people as possible and just have great conversations. Um, I also wanted to very quickly talk about the chat feature. Uh, you can see that on the right hand side of your screen. So the general chat addresses everyone in the room. The table chat addresses everyone currently at the table with you. You can also use the chat to search for individuals and send private messages. But please note that although the private chat messages can go across floors and tables, they cannot go across rooms. So if you're in the lobby and send a message to someone who's in the breakout room, that person will not see the message until they return to the lobby where you sent that message. Throughout the event, in all active event spaces, you'll be able to find ePostal Board staff if you need help. Uh, if you connect to any space labeled Help Desk, we'll be there to help you. If you're having trouble finding us on the upper floors, definitely come down to floor one and check that Help Desk. Uh, you can also double click and join us wherever we are. If you see a little yellow star icon on the map view, uh, you, can, you can join the room that we're in. You can message us via the participants list or the chat, and we are here to help you and make sure that uh, you find everything that you're looking for. So uh, one last comment, which is super important. Refreshing your browser, as Heather mentioned, will kick you out temporarily and bring you back in automatically. Refreshing the page will resolve the vast majority of technical hiccups with the software. Um, for example, if your camera and microphone won't activate, if you suddenly can't hear the stage presentation or can't see, if the software won't allow you to move, just try a browser refresh and you'll likely find that it resolves the issue. So I've covered a lot of information here. Uh, and in case you didn't catch all that, I want to remind you that as Heather pointed out, there's a tutorial video at the top left uh, corner of most uh, map views. And you can, you can view that at any time uh, if you'd like to get a recap of some of this information. And um, with that, we're going to be beginning to bring up the speakers for our next session. So I want to thank everyone for your attention and just uh, stand by for a moment while we bring everyone up. I'm starting with Drew. So Drew, we're going to bring you up on stage. Go ahead and accept that invite. I'm going to jump off the stage here for a second and bring everyone else up. Everyone, while the speakers are getting uh, sent up to the stage, um, they're going to individually uh, do a brief overview, um, all the speakers, uh, of the talks that hopefully you've managed to see ahead of time. Then we're going to move from that into a Q&A session, um, and then we'll talk about the breakout charge after that. So I'm going to bring up the slides. and put myself on mute um, so that we can get started right away as soon as all the speakers are on stage. Wait for my little timer and then I'll get started. Ah, perfect. Awesome. Uh, my name is Bethany Edwards. I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley. Um, and I, um, my talk, I gave an overview of um, the central dogma of molecular biology. So DNA getting transcribed into RNA, which gets translated into proteins. Um, and then those proteins include some enzymes um, which act on um, the substrates and products, and those would be metabolites, right? Um, and I gave this overview of, of omics um, and that DNA um, we could look at all the DNA in a sample, um, and that would be the metagenome. We could look at all the RNA, that would be the metatranscriptome. We could look at all the proteins, um, that would be the, the metaproteome. Um, and then talked about how um, we can use these omic tools to study these really complex microbial ecosystems um, that cycle carbon through the ocean, either through the biological carbon pump, um, so mostly focusing on, on particular organic carbon, or the microbial carbon pump, mostly focusing on um, um, dissolved organic materials. Um, and then we kind of did this case study, or at least looked at um, these diel studies at um, Station Aloha. And um, some of the things that were revealed there by pairing transcriptomics um, with uh, lipidomics um, and metabolomics um, and look at 
um, you know, energy storage molecules that are being cycled in the surface ocean and how you can tie those to actual um, rates, something up to 12% of um, primary productivity being cycled through lipid pools um, on a daily basis just to um, meet the, the intracellular requirements um, of, of these marine microbes. Um, we also, um, they had, um, the, the authors of these diol studies had found that there were different diol cadences um, for different, um, different metabolites. And, and then we took a, a deeper dive into um, some, a, another example of integrated omics. Um, we can stay on this side for a second, Drew. Um, where we integrated across a dissolved lipidome and a particulate lipidome um, and paired that with viral reads from a metatranscriptome and 18S amplicon sequencing um, to, to try to say something about this ecosystem where we already had some idea that there were, was viral um, infection at Point Reyes um, and uh, a, an active viral infection going on at Monterey Bay, but an infection that had already completed, at least with respect to diatom viruses um, at Point Reyes. And we took a descriptive view um, and kind of looked at these um, dissolved lipidome and the particulate lipidome overall. Uh, but then we applied some um, multivariate statistics um, that were developed to specifically look across different types of data sets from the same samples um, and, and pull out, you know, what are the most important components? Um, what are the most um, distinctive components um, for um, these two different sites? Um, we can go to the next slide, um, Drew. Thank you. Um, and so um, by, by applying this, um, you know, integrative omics, this mixed omics um, type of approach using multivariate analysis and machine learning, um, we were able to, to develop some new hypotheses um, about uh, viral infection in the system. We have, um, we found that there was um, two diatoms, the Thalassiosira and Navicula, who um, their 18S um, read abundance was correlated with some of these dissolved lipids um, that we know to, to inhibit grazing, that we know diatoms produce when they're stressed out, um, that we've observed um, getting produced during viral infection. Um, and uh, so, so that's kind of a brief overview, um, drinking from a fire hose of, of what I talked about in my um, in my OCB talk, um, and I'm happy to, to take questions about this, um, but you know, kind of the take takeaway is that when we step back um, and take these um, this very broad open view of the system and integrate across um, transcriptomes and lipidomes um, and, and proteomes, um, hopefully in the future, um, we'll see more, more of that. Um, we can start to ask questions that we didn't even know we had, and we can gain a better understanding of the system um, by not having this a priori information um, and taking a, a step back in a more open view. Shall I just go? Um, hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Barton. I am an assistant professor at UC San Diego and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, today I'm talking about 16S and 18S uh, amplicon sequence data and how we can use that to reveal patterns of uh, microbial biodiversity, community structure, and endemism. And the focal area here is the Southern California Current because there's this incredible uh, program started by Andrew Allen and colleagues to uh, use uh, molecular tools to uh, along Cal Coffee cruises, and this has been going on for about five years. So we have this wealth of data with which to examine these important questions in microbial ecology. Uh, a lot of collaborators here. I just briefly uh, list them at the bottom. I'm here speaking about this work, but I'm but one person um, involved. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, in a short amount of time, we, you know, I'll just I'll highlight some of the findings that I thought were most interesting. Uh, the top figure here shows the number of ASVs or amplicon sequence variants along these Cal Coffee lines. Uh, and the color in the left, top left, shows you the number of uh, this sort of alpha diversity, which is a number of species present at a given time and place. Uh, and you can see that it's highest offshore and lowest nearshore. Uh, on the right, you see 
a plot, which is the distance to coast on the bottom versus the Shannon index, which is another diversity metric. The bottom line is the alpha diversity, and the top line is the gamma diversity. And so you can think of this as the kind of gamma diversity tells you the total amount of species present over the year, and then the alpha diversity tells you the amount present at a given time. And obviously there's a succession of species, so you see more species present over time at each place. Uh, here I don't show this, but we found that these gradients in biodiversity and community structure were most strongly driven by uh, the availability of nutrients, not by temperature or other factors one might uh, consider. Uh, another interesting finding, contrary to this idea that everything is everywhere, is that cosmopolitan microbes are extraordinarily rare. Uh, you don't find everything everywhere uh, in, these, in this context. Um, we also found that the lar a large fraction of the ASVs uh, are found in a particular biome. So you're either a nearshore ASV or an offshore ASV, and you're generally not both. Um, and then interestingly, um, a lot of the organisms found in this part of the ocean are not found in the Tara Oceans data. Uh, so this is suggestive that there is some degree of endemism uh, in this particular part of the ocean. Um, please uh, come see a poster by a student in my lab, Chase James, to learn more, and I thank all of you for your attention. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Daniele Udicone, I'm a physical oceanographer at Stazione Zoologica in Naples, but also Coordinator of the, the Tara Ocean Consortium and uh, recently uh, also the coordinator of a European project that I will uh, present very shortly. Next, please. My talk will try to give uh, an overview of the challenges uh, uh, we have now, uh, at least from uh, our experience after this, uh, this effort. Uh, basically, the point was to is to connect three different complex systems, which is uh, the biology, the organism. The, the interaction, so the, the ecology of the system, and then there is the physics, the physics of the fluid that is at a substrate for everything. And in particular, I wanted to also to underline that uh, we don't know really how to treat uh, um, the seascape in a way that is to be proper. So we are really importing a lot of terrestrial uh, theorists, uh, and uh, we still, I think, uh, need some more think about how to do sampling the ocean, how to understand the ocean, even that everything is transported. Next, please. Um, so, uh, one part of the talk was dedicated to presenting the, the results from this uh, Tara Ocean uh, expedition we did uh, now 10 years ago. And it was the first uh, large-scale expedition which was uh, genomic enabled. And we had a series of results. The first probably was to demonstrate that uh, there is a significant but measurable uh, diversity, but I want to underline that uh, actually 50% of the genes we have described are completely unknown to science, either in terms of taxonomy and function. So there are big challenges ahead. Uh, we also demonstrated there is a, a sort of global interactome, so a lot of species are apparently interacting, and most of them as a, as a cooperation. And then we demonstrated it was a, we can derive a global biogeography using these metagenomes, but still there is a challenge because of uh, the transport. So these uh, regions are flushed out by currents, so we still have to understand how we can have a permanent stable biogeography within such a uh, special substrate. So I try to suggest a series of, uh, of questions. One is uh, how to derive, produce, to work together to produce a conceptual model of the ocean. Here we really need strong interdisciplinary. Uh, how to redesign sampling strategy, and I suggested to have more project studies, but also to augment observatories with uh, an increased uh, uh, rich set of uh, sampling strategies. And then uh, there is a challenge of integrating heterogeneous data because the omics data have, uh, are comp uh, compositional data and there are a lot of trouble yet to solve, to be solved to, to use those data. And then I underline, for instance, that we should go back to measure rates in the ocean because the genomics is, or the omics or this kind of uh, new approach are not going to solve everything. Uh, finally, I presented two, two new features. One is a, a large-scale project dedicated to the Atlantic microbiome with these tools, Atlantigo, that started uh, nine months ago and will go out for almost five years. 
and I invite every one of you to join the effort. And then also a new expedition, a new tire expedition that will start at the end of July from the Caraibs and will go all around the, the Atlantic with new project studies dedicated to, to the question I have been mentioning. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Elise Larkin. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Earth System Science at UC Irvine. And as you know, sort of Bethany and Andrew have shown, um, our understanding of marine microbial omics and biogeography has expanded recently in recent or significantly in recent years. And additionally, as Daniele was talking about, over the past 10 years, we've also seen a concurrent increasing equivalency in terms of the spatial and temporal coverage of co-collected hydrographic and omics based measurements which has allowed us to begin to develop a strong synergy between um, and biogeochemistry as well as an improved ability to link marine microbial adaptation to nutrient, oxygen, and carbon cycles. On so uh, as a part of a new uh, biological component of the GoShip um, collection uh, initiatives, our lab collected over a thousand surface DNA samples at high spatial resolution with a median distance between samples of about 26.5 kilometers. Um, we then sequenced the metagenomes of these uh, surface samples and made them publicly. Uh, next slide. So in our initial analysis of genomes, we annotated and quantified uh, the coverage or more or less the abundance of Prochlorococcus nutrient genes. We then normalized by the coverage of single copy core genes. So these are genes that are, we only have a single copy in all reference genomes that are part of a specific clade. And then we summarized gene coverage using a principal components analysis. And what we saw was this tripartite partitioning of the ordination space um, suggesting uh, strong stoichiometric linkages between the different types of nutrient stress. Moreover, when we uh, back projected where our samples fall in the ordination space, right? So if we use the vectors from the PCA to define um, angular cutoffs of where those samples fall in the ordination space and then back project it on a global scale, we see systematic shifts between the dominant types of nutrient stress and co-stress on a global scale. And the exciting thing about this is um, when we sort of summarize these nutrient stress metrics, we also see um, significant correlations with surface uh, nitrate and phosphate, or surface nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, thus, we're able to quantitatively link microbial adaptation to basin scale nutrient flux, which is largely aided by these high spatial resolution measurements, as well as aided by sort of the power of these sort of co-collected data sets. And so I think it's a, a very exciting direction for um, microbial ecology and biogeochemistry on a global scale. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Max Saito. Um, I, uh, online, there's a, a five-minute brief summary of the Biogeoscapes effort, which is a bottom-up effort to create a new global program to study ocean metabolism and nutrient cycles on a changing planet. Um, the presentation there is uh, a representation of the US effort um, to commit an to present an ocean shot for the decade of ocean sciences for sustainable development, uh, and these are my co-conveners listed here. But I want to emphasize that there's a larger uh, international community that's been contributing to this biogeoscapes uh, conceptualization and development, and uh, and it's an open and ongoing process. So we encourage anyone who's interested to go to the website and uh, join the mailing list and learn about updates as we move forward on this. So the Biogeoscapes effort is really um, aimed at trying to understand um, ocean metabolism, which we know is the heart of our planetary support system. It scales from intercellular processes to organisms to ecosystem scales. 
And the mission statement currently is to improve our understanding of, its function, of the functioning and regulation of ocean metabolism and its interactions with nutrient cycling in the context of a hierarchical seascape perspective with the motivation to try and constrain bi biological feedbacks on our changing planet. Next slide, please. And the vision really tries to take an integrated approach to combining the omics, a biological omics of genomics and transcriptomics, and the more chemical omics of proteomics, lipidomics, and metabolomics, as well as combining that with uh, biogeochemical and geochemical measurements, um, to, and, and then combining these efforts to really create a global scale quantification of microbial communities so that we can understand metabolism and its, in, its influence on ocean uh, ecosystem health and biogeochemical cycles. And so Biogeoscapes, we recognize, is an effort that's going to be um, larger than any one country can do alone. Um, this is very much a bottom-up effort, as I mentioned before. And um, uh, the vision currently is to try and have full-depth, basin-scale ocean sections, uh, time series, as well as process studies as part of this effort. Um, and uh, it will develop rich biological and chemical data sets that will uh, improve our integration between observations and models. And so um, we have a upcoming workshop that we've just set the date for, um, November 3rd through 5th. Uh, this is going to be for the U.S. OCB National Planning Meeting, where we'll try and discuss our capabilities and our priorities. And, um, and then all of the national meetings will then come back to the international um, effort to try and combine a global vision and a science plan. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, are there any questions? Any? And as Adam put in the chat, which you might not have seen, uh, in order to ask the questions, you're going to have to enter them into the Q&A um, box that is the third tab on the right of your uh, of the top of the screen. Um, and if someone asks the same question as you, you can always upvote their question, so. Well, while we wait for uh, people to type in the questions, I guess I have a question for the speakers. For example, Danielle talked about the need for rates, and I think a lot of biogeochemists will agree that rates are really important. This is one thing since everyone mostly spoke about sort of omics techniques, I wonder if you could speculate how you can use those omics measurements to describe rates. Don't be shy. I, I can start with a quick comment. Yes, uh, I think uh, we need. Uh, I think we need rates uh, measured directly as an independent information. And so we are not ready to use a meta so or this kind of um, data to be quantitative on each single station. And this is uh, for a bit of a technical discussion, but we still do not know how to properly normalize, I think, this data. This is, there is a big problem on normalization issue. So I think it would be very informative to have an independent estimate of the, the rates and, uh, and then putting together, try to learn how to use this uh, omics data in a better way, in a better quantitative way. Can I jump in on that question too? I think that's a, a really great and exciting topic. And you know, there's this sort of meme out there that you know omics are stamp collecting and can't do rates. And, and I think it's trying time to try and you know show the community that that's not really true anymore. And I think um, you know at, at least in your talk you had this really nice example of you know. Um, uh, the metagenomic capability, looking at reads, how they extend out from the, um, you know, this, the origin replication to get growth rates. That's super exciting. Um, and, you know, we've been trying with the protein work to try and measure absolute quantities that are in, you know, copy numbers per liter of seawater of an enzyme. And we know from the definition of biochemical measurements that if you combine that with a specific activity, you can calculate a rate. And um, we, we recognize that those substrates are um, often or those enzymes are often substrate limited, but I think that's a first order way of getting a, a potential rate um, from an omics. So I think, you know, that, those are two examples and I think there's a lot, a ton of space for us to keep going um, and exploring that and then connecting that with models as well. To add that with metabolomics and lipidomics, you are measuring the end products um, of some of these metabolic processes. So if you um, sample correctly, you can get it 
get at rates. Um, it does require um, that everyone, you know, you can't just take a sample and move off site. You, you do have to continue to, to measure that body of water over time and measure the change in those metabolites over time. Um, and then you can get at rates. Which I'm... <laughs> Um, I have a question for <clears throat> that came in the Q&A for Andrew. Could you elaborate on the correlation between diversity and the time? Thanks for the question. So, ooh, actually the question went away, but basically um, we're conceiving of the depth of the nutricline as kind of a proxy for the supply of the nutrients from below. Um, and so when the supply of nutrients is really high, the overall diversity in the microbial community is really low. Uh, and when the supply is uh, low, the diversity is conversely higher. Um, so that mirror, that looks a lot like what people have found on global surveys like Tara. So microbial diversity tends to be really high in the tropics and subtropics and low at higher latitudes. So I don't know, but I think the mechanism for this is that when nutrients are high, you tend to get opportunistic species that outcompete others really effectively. And so these are the kind of classic uh, opportunistic uh, high growth rate things like diatoms, and they're able to outcompete the rest. Whereas when nutrients are low, it's kind of that it tends to be there's a little more room for more organisms to eke by. And, and in this coastal upwelling biome, we find that general gradient as well. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so we have a question for Ali. Um, were there abrupt transitions along some of the sections in your map, lined with like ocean fronts or other environmental or circulation features? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I would emphasize that part of the reason we could see some of those transitions so well is because we had these really high spatial resolution measurements concurrently with our geochemical measurements, right? So for instance, one really well characterized re region is the um, Eastern Pacific Ocean, right? Where we have upwelling, which uh, relieves nitrogen and phosphorus stress and results in a state of iron stress. And as we move out from that, um, uh, that uh, physical feature, right, we see these transitions to, you know, sort of nitrogen stress and even further out different types of stress. So, you know, it absolutely very well aligns with sort of our understanding of ocean circulation and these features. But, you know, if we had just taken samples, you know, that were very um, spatially disparate, we wouldn't have been able to as clearly link, you know, these, this gene content to the geographic features. And so I think that comes back to sort of what Bethany was talking about with, you know, you need, in order to get at rates, you need high temporal resolution measurements and to get at sort of the really strong like geographic features, which um, Andrew was talking about as well. And these transitions, you really need high spatial resolution measurements. And so I think we're able to get at that by sort of increasing the resolution of the samples we're taking. Thank you, Elise. Uh, this is a, a question that I imagine Daniela at least would uh, enjoy answering, but, but please feel free, the rest of you, to uh, join in here. The complexity revealed by all of this work is all inspiring, yet on an ecosystem scale, functional features like primary productivity appears to be relatively constant. What does that imply? Maybe any other, if you want to start, then you can go around. That's a very good point. And uh, that, that is uh, the, the biogenical machinery is always uh, working at uh, optimum, in a certain optimal state. The, what is amazing is that when you go there, then you discover there are 10,000 species that are somehow there doing something. So we still have to understand how to put together these two, two visions. And then we have that, that if you look at the composition of the species, the distribution of abundances, you can actually fit a totally neutral model. So no ecology, no biology. So these are the two extremes of the situation. What the problem is going to happen is happening is that there are very few species that dominate the biochemical response of the system. 
and uh, but still we don't know what the other is doing and if they maybe can uh, there is a turnover or and so there are yeah indeed many other questions anyone else wants to chime in on this one the nice question sure um you know i think it's a it's a great question and um it's sort of a question of why do we need all these omics measurements and um you know, or more classical measurements like you know primary productivity and chlorophyll we're sort of seeing the end state of the ecosystem um but we don't know how it got there right and i think these windows into the the gene catalog and the biochemistry um let us see what the ecosystem is doing and feeling right and um, you know, maybe the systems are all limited by nitrogen and phosphorus and iron, but I suspect, well, we're learning they're really not. And some of them are transitioning to other elements and, you know, moving over to B12 primary or secondary limitation and things like that, for example. Um, those are things that are really hard to know from just chlorophyll measurements or more classical measurements. But the 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 omics measurements can really let us see that process um, as it's underway. All right, maybe the last question we have time for today. Um, what is the capacity potential for measuring uh, hyotrophic levels and food web processes through these integrated programs and approaches? It's somewhat limited by your sampling size, right? So um, you could certainly, you know, there might be in a very abundant water mass, there might be 100 copepods per liter. Um, so certainly there you could um, sample their DNA, their lipids, their metabolites, um, and, and potentially get it it's some idea of, of who the grazers are. Um, you, you would have to sample, you know, quite a bit more water um, to, you know, employ mock nesses, those types of things to get at these other processes. But um, I don't see why not. I think it's just a, a function of, of how we're sampling for microbes versus how we're sampling for these higher trophic levels. Maybe a quick comment is that, uh -huh. no, a quick comment is that, yeah, in, in, uh, in Tarotion, we and in the next expedition, we're going to, to cover also the, the zooplankton at least uh, down to a few millimeters. So in that case, through transcriptomics, at least, uh, what can we <clears throat> can try to, to get uh, uh, some answer to this question, even if it, we know that genomes are very complex for, for cover pots, for instance. But I just want to add uh, one, in one sentence that now there's eDNA coming. Uh, uh, eDNA is, uh, is trying to describe in, uh, with genetic tools the entire trophy web, up to seabirds and weights, et cetera. But still, it's, it's in its infancy. So this could be at least a way to understand what was a truck case, even if you focus on a few groups, but uh, at least the big picture at the same time. I know it, um, the Monterey Bay Time series, they um, get anchovy um, coming up in their eDNA samples, and they're clearly not capturing anchovies in the few liters of water, but um, their DNA is, is present in the water. All right. Um, thanks for all these uh, great questions and answers and great presentations both uh, prior to today and today. Uh, now, uh, Drew, do you want to give the breakout charge? All right. Well, uh, again, that was a great set of questions and, and uh, hopefully these talks and the brief overviews have started to have you start thinking about some of the continued questions that we have, especially as we start thinking about moving towards um, pulling together a, a combined omics on a larger scale. So the primary questions, uh, all of these questions are gonna be sort of listed in your breakout groups, um, just, uh, just so you're aware of that, you don't have to memorize this, but, we have a list of sort of the primary questions that it would be great to get more community feedback on and discuss among yourselves as sort of primary questions. Primary ones, what are the specific biogeochemical and ecological questions that we haven't been able to answer yet that could be answered by a formal effort to pair geochemical measurements with omic measurements? 
um, what are the challenges that still remain in making such an effort successful? So uh, some have already been brought up in the questions that you guys have posed in this Q&A session. Um, some are speakers brought up in their talks, um, intercalibration, time scales, uh, many other things uh, that I'm sure you guys have thought of that we couldn't even put on the list. Um, and is now the right time for a coordinated effort to combine geochemistry and biological omics sampling on a more global scale? Um, in other words, a biogeoscapes type effort. Are we there yet? And sort of what are we maybe missing or what's still needed before we could do that? Um, and then secondary, uh, or these might be of more interest to whatever your uh, breakout group is, uh, are the, what are co-collected um, or nearly co-collected data sets that are available already um, or expected soon? Uh, what are some exciting new discoveries that have come from coordinated sampling efforts? So the goal um, of this breakout session is for you all to be sitting and uh, virtually sitting in small groups and discuss these questions. And then uh, you'll have about, uh, the plan is to have 50, um, 50 minutes for talking in smaller groups and then come back to the larger, um, to the larger room to reconvene and give uh, insight from your breakout table to the rest of the community. Um, in the breakout rooms, you're going to have access to whiteboards and things. Those aren't going to be recorded. Nothing in the breakout rooms are recorded. Um, so feel free to talk candidly amongst yourselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Sinika Lennas, and I'm a junior professor at the University of Oldenburg, currently visiting at MIT. I am reporting for Floor one, table one, where we had a lively discussion in our group with Mac, Daniela, Laura, Sky, Kimberly, and Elisa. And we discussed that pairing geochemical and ecological me measurement really gives us a, a comprehensive picture on the processes happening. And that would be really helpful to, to decipher underlying mechanisms that shape the ocean's ecosystem and its functioning, especially when we wanna assess expected changes in a future climate. We talked a lot about scaling up these measurements um, using models and then for models it's it's helpful to have rates as well as standing stocks along environmental gradients. And we see challenge, challenges, that was question two I think, um, in condensing this huge information that we get from omics approaches into meaningful parameterizations for models. We talked about clustering this information but also stated that it's probably for different questions, we need different clusters, but but still this might be might be possible given this wealth of information that we get from omics approaches. But in order to achieve this, we really would need to develop a common language to facilitate communication and to enhance the, the flow of information. We also talked about pairing dedicated process studies in a controlled laboratory environment. Um, in order to decipher the ecological mechanisms um, and, and relate them to, to omics measurements. And in the end, we all agreed that, that many questions would benefit from a concerted effort like biogeoscapes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Patrick Rafter. I'm reporting out for uh, our group. This is day one of the OCB 2021 workshop entitled Bridging the Divide Between Ocean Biology and Geochemistry. Uh, in our breakout group, we had Andrew Barton, one of the plenary speakers, Ben Twining, Margie Friedrichs, uh, Tatiana Reinerson, myself, and uh, one person who I did not get her last name, but her first name was Dedola. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry about that for if I mispronounced it. So we had an um, uh, interesting, vigorous conversation. Um, we had one of the plenary speakers, so of course we began by asking the questions we didn't ask uh, during the Q&A. Um, we didn't immediately get to the uh, breakout questions, um, but this was, uh, this was informative. We discussed uh, the, well, we discussed the challenges for um, the uh, imaging that was being discussed uh, in uh, Andrew Barton's talk, um, specifically the imaging flow cytometer 
um, that uh, is going to be applied to the Cal Coffee cruises. So uh, to uh, a place where you could have these repeat visits to the same sites, um, more of a Eulerian approach. Um, but the, the challenges to this being, you know, how to combine or how to use this, this imaging capacity um, to say something uh, about the omics, the different omics. And the, so the challenges that are faced. And um, I guess one of the things we learned was that one of the challenges is uh, simply uh, developing um, useful data set from the imaging. So I, I, I guess there's some um, AI that's gonna be involved in the, to be able to process this, these images, but that there should be a, a rather large um, data set that can then be uh, woven together with uh, other data sets. Um, uh, and for example, the omics that we were um, discussing today. Um, so then we moved into the breakout questions a little bit. Uh, the first one uh, being what questions are, um, are still remaining to be answered. Uh, with geochemistry and the different omics approaches. Um, so the, uh, I guess the, um, not really a, a large question, but the, the reasons why to um, continue with this approach of uh, sort of the geochemistry in one hand and the omics in the other hand is to uh, provide a, a, a better predictive capacity, especially with respect to the biological carbon pump. Um, so we didn't really come down on um, any specific questions that remained as much as we decided as a group that you know it's it's incredibly important to um, come have these approaches hand in hand on uh, any upcoming programs such as biogeoscapes. Uh, the other question we addressed in the breakout group was um, what challenges still remain um, that could be addressed with these new data sets. Um, I guess, um, and, and we sort of got a little sidetracked, uh, but in a good way, um, discussing challenges that not just remain, but the, some of what would be the biggest challenges that a program such as Biogeoscapes would face. And so a program such as Biogeoscapes, uh, I'm sure is wrestling with this question, but the largest challenge we saw is, you know, um, where are the boundaries both, um, temporal and spatial uh, boundaries for such a program. So for example, GoShip uh, and GeoTraces, they've taken largely a survey approach um, versus a process study approach. Uh, it's not true for all the geos, uh, GeoTraces um, cruises, which have um, some process study sites but you know, I guess the big challenge is where to draw that line. You know, where um, you know. So we we have some. Uh, there's quite a bit of interest in these large survey approaches. Just you know, first time go first time uh, observations in these sites. Um, these some of this has been done from other previous work, such as Tara. Um, but um, anyway, that was our that um, we talked about was the challenges and challenges that were raised there were not, not a surprise to anyone in this room, things like standardization. Um, and this also came up in the, are we ready to go to a global, uh, a global uh, survey? How do we make sure that we have things like common libraries and um, that uh, common standards uh, for, for, for genomic um, information in particular, but also one can think maybe it's easier on the, on the lipidomics and metabolomics, although Bethany, you will tell me if that's wrong. Um, but, you know, insofar as we don't even know what organisms are out there, how can we standardize this? How can we make sure that what we're sampling is not just simply determined by, well, we put these primers in and this is what we got back, right? So that we're that that what we think is is geographic shifts is not simply floristic shifts. Um, we also um, had a little bit of discussion about where some of the real progress has been made. Maite Maldonado pointed out the the really important work that's been done with iron, um, and uh, you know I think I think um, Elisa's work that she presented with with uh, 
was also really exciting. And uh, Adrian Marchetti talked about um, the moving, the lifting up the hood of the car, right? That that that's what we're we're doing and seeing that you know it. Yes, it drives, but there's a lot more going on under the hood than we thought. And we had some discussions about what that might mean for responses to change, right? Um, the idea that a system, for example, that responds linearly to changes in input will be different than a system that responds quadratically to changes in input. So that was, anyone else from my group is welcome to type into the chat. That's great. Um, I see we have two more report outs and we have some time remaining. It, do any of the other panelists want to chime in on anything they've heard so far? Okay, you can you can if you want, I guess is what I'll, I want to say. Um, the next from Natalie Arazzo, floor one, table 10. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Natalia, and uh, yeah, I'll be reporting for Table 10. Uh, we had Bethany was there, uh, Drew, Elise, and some other people that I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't say their name. Um, so we kind of talked about some of the different, some of the challenges um, currently in sort of trying to sort of better um, kind of understand this um, biogeochemical process in like, especially like they, in, in the ocean. And so one of the things that was really this idea about a standard of metadata and especially across different sampling efforts and how we can you know work better to sort of make that in a way that is um you know more available uh open and sort of uh that other groups can reproduce it and kind of again with sort of that idea sort of how do we maintain those sort of fair data principles um in sort of the way that we're collecting data but um there were other things brought up um sort of in the question about sort of data storage um, how there are sort of different platforms like GitHub where you can store some kind of data, but there seem to be some limitations with capacity. Um, with respect to sort of omics data, we have quite a, um, pipelines and algorithms that we can use to process that data. And depending on what pipeline you use, you might get a completely different understanding of the you know, microbial community. So, um, you know, how do we better um, standardize that? Um, another thing that was kind of brought up was how do we kind of maybe develop a more easy or accessible language among uh, physics and chemists and biologists so that we can all kind of communicate about the work that has been done. And in kind of future questions, some of the things we we're talking was this idea about sort of modeling and what are some key parameters that are important. The idea about uh, functionality was brought up, uh, but then the question about does community structure matter and when does it matter? And some of the things that we were talking about was in, in terms of sort of interactions. And uh, there was this um, idea, one of the things that I think we are kind of, um, we don't know really much about it, it was in the role that I play and sort of thinking about uh, when does host specificity might matter, and like um, that could be uh, cases where that community structure matter. But also, you know, ideas of sort of with, you know, players in terms, you know, like cyanobacteria, for instance, we kind of talk about, you know, cases with or trichodesmian would like trichodesmian kind of heavily relies on some of this interaction with the heterotrophic community. And another thing we kind of were talking about where um, there are techniques available that can really help us to sort of get um, particular question of like um, what are doing and so there are some kind of fluorescent new techniques where you can get at sort of single cell um, measurements and that can really kind of help us better understand who's doing what. And I think that was it. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. I like that you, I think you mentioned something about um, developing a shared language so the different disciplines can um, understand each other. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I've been, I've been um, trying to learn new languages myself so I can um, understand my friends, my omics friends. Uh, Naomi Levine, 
Floor one, table five. Sorry. Hey, um, so we had a really great discussion uh, with um, at the table with Susanna Mendauer, Jamie Poulter, John Dunn, Adam Martini, Rue Nicholson, Indy Volson, and Christina Confessor. Um, I got nominated at the very end, so I hope I had um, taking Jamie's notes that she took. We had a really great discussion um, that touched upon a bunch of different topics. We kind of started first with actually a nuns question uh, from the chat of why we even need to do this, integrating omics and biogeochemistry uh, when we think about large scale fluxes, um, what we can gain from it. Um, and similar to some of the other groups, we also highlighted the um, importance of elucidating the underlying mechanisms to allow us to improve models and predictions, identifying nonlinear responses and shifts. We then started thinking a bit about um, kind of the Biogeoscapes program uh, and how to move forward. And our group really honed in on the fact that one of the powers of these integrated um, field efforts with omics and uh, biogeochemistry is, is really thinking about processes and rates and interactions. And the feeling was that the um, kind of, I don't really want to use the word low hanging fruit, but a Lagrangian framework in process studies is, is something that we could, we as a group envisioned could happen now and be really powerful. Um, and that led us to this, the kind of contrast between that and, and surveys and for surveys talking, we started talking a lot about intercalibration and the need to calibrate between groups in order before the surveys were done in order for them to be powerful. Um, so one thought that kind of emerged from our discussion was whether, um, we needed to have kind of a two-phase um, approach where we, we really got started on these kind of really exciting interdisciplinary programs, doing process studies um, while we're um, working on these hard intercomparisons and, and um, validations and, and standardizations that we need to do, but not waiting for those to be completed. Um, and then taking lessons learned from programs such as exports um, to help us design really successful uh, programs. Uh, also, the need for new manipulations uh, in the field and in the lab to allow us to help better improve mechanisms and understanding. Um, and we ended on a really nice discussion of how models play into this um, and how we might be able to use models to provide um, across site comparisons um, and, and integrate knowledge from a bunch of different process studies, um, thinking about um, kind of examples such as like harmful algal blooms and such where we might be able to get at mechanisms using models that allow us to look at other sites and, and um, better predict or forecast events. Um, I think that's pretty much what we covered. Great, thanks, Naomi. Thank, thank you very much, Naomi. Um, seems like we've, uh, some of the groups have been finding similar um, points of interest or areas um, to more deeply. Thanks. Um, next up is the uh, the last table two report. I'm sorry if I mispronounced Hongji Wang from floor one, table 11. Yes, this is Hongji Wang. Um, let's go and get back to my whiteboard. Okay, uh, oh, whiteboard, yeah. Now I see my notes. Can I see my notes here? Um, okay, um, so I click the three dots and the whiteboard, uh, but it's a very small window. Um, okay. Uh, we can use the window. Um, it's in like, the upper right corner, there's there are four arrows and they're all pointing out and that will make it big. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, bring up your, will be uh -huh. small, but go to that window and click on the upper right arrows for, uh -huh. for anyone viewing, you can see it larger. If I could chime in really quickly, just on, oh, I, think there, yeah. there's some, I think there might be some confusion here because uh, the whiteboard that we're seeing is the stage mode whiteboard, uh, like the state whiteboards oh. of the individual tables. 
So sorry oh, for okay. the, the confusion there, but uh, yeah, for the report outs um, notes, because the, the whiteboard that's there is just what the stage is whiteboard. So again, I apologize for that. Sorry, um, Mike, sorry. I thought we were able to access from whatever oh. table you're sitting at. <laughs> sorry, oh. Hongji, that I gave you the wrong information. Oh, don't worry. I, I, I think I can try to remember us as some of notes we took during our discussion. Uh, we had a very small group, three, uh, one uh, uh, and Michael and also Raf. And so I, I, we spent a few minutes to warm up to introduce ourselves at the very beginning. And then we discussed about the tipping point. So a tipping point means like when the system will, uh, will never get, get back to what it used to be as in a versatile point. And uh, Ralph mentioned that it's like a chain reaction, uh, so you want a lot of var uh, variables. So, and then we discuss a little bit on another question, I think. Um, so, uh, what kind of uh, challenge? So, I think one challenge is about data gaps, uh, are both spatially and temporally. So, uh, we think uh, it may be very uh, 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 emerging to develop some new and cheap uh, available uh, innovation, try to fill in the data gaps. And also Mike mentioned that, um, you know, uh, instead of to answer a question, hey, we want to better understand the system, we may want to bring the scientific, uh, the very specific scientific question first. And then we find uh, we zoom in this scientific question and eventually then we compared the the question from different uh, perspective like to initiate some effective uh, interdisciplinary collaboration based on the question we uh, answered and so this the uh, and what else we discussed about oh so for example oh, about tipping point sorry i tried to remember the, the things we discussed about tipping point we also discussed that maybe it's kind of uh, uh, easy not easy like uh, uh, like a low-hanging food like to to get the the tipping point or threshold for one piece, but it may may be very challenging to um, understand uh, the tipping point for entire ecosystem because it's such a complex ecosystem. And and what else? <laughs> I think uh, Mike, welcome to uh, uh, in If you think I missed something. <laughs> Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. So that's our that's our last report out. Um, or at the tail end, the first day post workshop. I'm imagining Heather's going to show up and say something. Yes. Um, thanks, everybody, for a great session, and the report outs were fantastic. Um, sorry for the whiteboard glitch. Uh, we're, we're not able to share. I thought we were able to share our whiteboards from whatever table we're sitting at when we're in stage mode, but I suggest in the future that you just take a screenshot of your whiteboard if you want to actually share it on the screen when you're reporting out. It's easy enough to just take a screenshot of it. Um, we are going to take a 15 minute break and then at 2.45, we are able to go into the networking space. You can go there now if you want, but you can go into the networking space. Please check the networking directory blue button to figure out what's happening where. Um, there are some folks that can't make it today. If, if, some of the, if there's somebody representing a table, they may or may not be there today. That information is in that directory. But um, when you leave this room, you can navigate directly to the networking space. Um, look at the directory, see where you want to go. We are going to post links in the chat to both the early career Jamboard and the um, Jedi Jamboard, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. We have a the whole first floor of the networking space is focused on Jedi topics. So, um, and that's it's actually the top floor is focused on early career. Um, and that's actually grouped out by career stage. And then there's a section of tables for mixing up career stages. Um, and plenty of topics to discuss. The jam boards are, are filled with ideas already for early career topics. Um, and I really hope that the Jedi jam board gets populated with some direct advice to OCB on how we can do better 
for both the OCB network and ocean sciences. So um, I think that's all I have to say. I will have an, we have an OCB table in the networking space as well. I believe that's on floor six. Um, and if you have questions, you can come talk to us. Or if you want to learn more about the program, please come over and, and see us.